you can be a global soul and be based in Wichita. Welcome, everybody. This is the Wichita Live Podcast. I am Landon Huesley, host of the Wichita Live Podcast and curator of the Wichita Live ICT Instagram. Today's guest is none other than the world-renowned travel writer, journalist, and podcaster, Rolf Potts. Rolf grew up in Wichita before beginning his writing and travel career. Rolf is best known for his book, Vagabonding, and one of his newest projects, his podcast, Deviate with Rolf Potts. We discuss his writing, travels, growing up in Wichita, and different approaches to life, money, and travel. Without further ado, enjoy my conversation with Rolf Potts. Welcome, Rolf. How's it going? Good. Good. Um, so, just wanted to say, first off, I'm a big fan of your work. Um, I read Vagabonding this past spring for the first time. Um, I've heard about you and about your book for a long time on the Tim Ferriss podcast, um, and I actually didn't realize you were from Wichita. I must have just missed that, but didn't realize you were from Wichita until my cousin recommended um, one of the episodes of the Ari Shapir podcast you were on. So I um, thought that was pretty cool, and running this podcast, thought it would be really interesting to interview you. Yeah, which did I mention Wichita in Ari's, in um, to Ari? You might have, or maybe you just mentioned Kansas, and then I looked it up, but um, either way, yeah, I didn't realize until around then. So Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very fond of Wichita, so it's... Good to, good to hear. Um, and... I know you have several books out. Um, you've been on a lot of different podcasts and now your own podcast um, and as well as a bunch of interviews. And so I kind of want this to serve um, partly as a conversation interview and just an introduction um, to a lot of Wichitans who might not know who you are um, and even kind of present you as an inspiration to what some Wichitans can achieve that they might not think possible. So, um, yeah. Cool. Um, that being said, can you just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Um, how do you introduce yourself when you meet other people? Oh, gosh, it depends. Do you mean in the podcast sense or in real life? Um, either way, real life is good. Well, I've, I've called myself a travel writer for, for a long time, and people like that. You know, it just it sounds cool, although uh, I'm sort of a multidisciplinary guy. I, I do some teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I've written several books and articles. I, I do my podcast. Um but I think travel writer is sort of what captures people's imagination. You know, if I say journalist, then it has this really complicated set of associations, some of which are political and and right. weird. And e even though I am a journalist, uh, travel travel is my focus. And, and really because of Vagabonding, which is my first book, it's been out for 15 years, but it's really, it's just a perennial bestseller. And it's what people uh, in greater numbers than my other books get excited about. Um, so yeah, oftentimes... When like at at events, I guess it would be pretentious to just dive right in and talk about my books to somebody I've never met before. But in <laughs> podcasts and events and stuff, I'm like the vagabonding guy. I'm the guy who who um, has sort of this philosophical advice for traveling for a year or two instead of a week or two. Right. Uh, and that is one, it, it captures people's imagination. And two, after all these years, I, I don't get tired of talking about it. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so from that, uh, just, I wanted to talk about your connection to Wichita off the bat. Um, so you grew up here, were you born here as well? Yeah, I was born in Wesley Hospital. Okay. Um, grew up around 21st and West Street, uh, on the West side. I went to OK Elementary, Hadley Junior High in Wichita North. Um, and actually I went to Friends University for one year and then I went to school off in Oregon and, and then moved on to Asia and was gone for a long time. And now I've come full circle. I'm, I live in Kansas. I actually live in the country near Salina. Uh, so I'm about an hour and a half from Wichita. But I dropped back down to Wichita. I have a lot of friends there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, earlier this month, um, I went back and, and rented an Airbnb to room at the Eaton Hotel for a couple nice. nights just to go back. And I literally, I was an old track runner, tra track and cross-country runner at North. Um, uh, and so I went back and I went running on my old running routes on the bike path uh, and in the big ditch up by where I grew up. Very cool. And I visited some old friends. And so it's funny that that um, you would approach me this month because recently I sort of had this sentimental return trip um, where I just I just sort of wanted to do some old Wichita things. I live an hour and a half away, but I realized that I I don't indulge myself in in my Wichita stuff. And so I, I literally just did that a few weeks ago. 
That's awesome. And uh, as, did it look a lot different? I know a lot of things are changing in Wichita. Um, was it different than the last time? I don't know how far before that you'd been here, but yeah, you know, um, it is. And I, I think for the most part, it's, it's changed in really good and interesting ways. I went back to the house I grew up in, up in, and it had the, the house number was spray painted on the curb with a Wichita flag, right? Yep. So the Wichita, oh, yeah. Wichita flag is blown up. And I've always been a fan of, which, of the Wichita flag. But then when I went running in the big ditch, it used to be really, uh, really an isolated run. Like I could go in 10 minutes, I could be off in the big ditch and it felt like I was in nature. Well, now some housing developments Mints have come up so you can see houses from my old running route in the big ditch, mm-hmm. um, which is weird, but fine. And then there's just, you know, there's like the De, um, the Delano district is really blown up nightlife oh, yeah. wise. There's the Douglas Design District. Old Town has been around, you know, since my mm-hmm. since I used to go out there when I lived here. But, um, yeah, I'm, it, it seems like Wichita is a thriving place. And I mean, it's impossible to get an objective Wichita answer from me because I've just always been a, a pro Wichita guy, but it, it seems like, uh, there's a lot of fun stuff going on down there. Yeah. There's a lot of big stuff going on. Just like you said, some of those different districts, but, and then the flag itself, I mean, that's probably been the last, I don't know, five to eight years. That's really blown up kind of a cultural renaissance and Wichita pride. It's really growing. I think. It's fun to see. You know, I follow the Wichita flag account on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, it comes up in my feed a lot. And um, I don't know. I, I really like that. I, my friend's wife, a, a good buddy of mine uh, who I usually hang out with when I'm in town, Mike Marlette, he used to run the F5 newspaper. Mm-hmm. Um, his his wife was sort of rolling her eyes over, you know, this sudden preponderance of the Wichita flag. <laughs> but I think I think it's awesome. Like, uh, Wichita is one of those self-deprecating towns, you know, like uh, when you're growing up there, you sort of are antsy and you want to leave and, and um, people put down on it. So it's, I think it's fun to see people just really representing the city and flying the flag. It's, it's been fun to watch. Yeah, it is really cool. Uh, my wife and I moved down to Corpus Christi for a year for work and I think we were kind of the same a little bit. Like we always love Wichita, but we're like, it'd be nice to get away for a little bit, but just being away even just for a year, we realized how much we missed Wichita and how great Wichita is. Yeah, I ended up, of course, I, I don't live in Wichita. I live in the country in Saline County. But uh, I did a podcast episode on on best places to live in America, and it was really the, the theme was you can move to Portland or, or Austin or New York or L.A. or something, but there's other places, dozens of them that are more affordable. Uh, and my frame of reference is Kansas, and so I did a lot of, of – um, I talked about Wichita quite a bit because it is an affordable city and it does have some cool places to eat and cool things to do. Uh, and so almost by accident, um, and my familiarity with, uh, with Wichita, I, you know, I gave it a lot of, a lot of airtime alongside, you know, Buffalo and Chattanooga and these other, these other hip towns around the city that are more affordable, but not necessarily as famous as the Austins and Portland's. Right. Yeah. I actually listened to that one. It's, it was, it's cool to hear Wichita on a bigger stage like that. Like, there's a couple smaller Wichita podcasts like this one, um, but it's cool to hear it on a bigger stage. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully I didn't. Hopefully my <clears throat> my uh, my listeners weren't overwhelmed with Kansas information, but uh, uh, I really do think it is a good value. There's a lot going on in the city, and it's an affordable place to live. So right. Um, did living in Wichita and growing up here did that make you? I mean, like you said, it's kind of self-deprecating, or I don't know. Some some people might call it uninspiring. Did that make you want to travel more or less as you grew up? It's hard to say. It feels like travel was always an instinct for me. You know, mm-hmm. when I was when I was growing up, my dad, uh, you know, he taught at Friends University for a while, and he took me on one of his biology field trips to Colorado, um, or we went to see family in eastern Kansas or Kansas City. And so, when I was young, it felt like travel was just summer vacation is what you lived for, and it was just this fun thing to do. And while I don't think I had a burning desire to leave Wichita necessarily. Um, I was really interested in the idea of people who had made it, Wichitans in the world who had made it. Mm-hmm. And when I was when I was a reporter for the Wichita North High Star, I did a story about famous, you know, North High Redskins. And so, yeah. the, we, we I did a story on Barry Sanders, but also um, like um, uh, Eugene Smith, like the famous Life magazine photographer. Uh, and, you know, there's just a long and interesting list of people. A lot, a lot of athletes came out of North High, but then a lot of people doing, doing interesting cultural things in the world. Vera Miles went to Hollywood. And, and um, anyway, so I was, I was, I, I liked Wichita, but I wanted to leave Wichita and become successful. And in my own way, I guess I did that while retaining a certain fondness 
for Wichita, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And I can definitely relate to uh, looking into successful Wichita, Wichitans. So, um, would, so have you always wanted to be a writer as well? I know your degree was in writing and literature. Um, and then I guess a follow-up question to that is, are travel and writing in your life so intertwined? Like if you did one, it, could you only do one of those? Or has it always been kind of both of those together? Well, I think to answer your second question first, the marriage of travel and writing was really where things began to sing for me. I had done travel and I had done writing, but that's sort of my sweet spot as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, and I just recorded my last season uh, uh, podcast with Ari Shafir. I hung out with him in L.A. for a while. And uh, I've sort of... I've sort of gone in directions other than travel in my podcast, but Ari kept saying travel is what you know. Travel is what you know deeply and that you can speak to articulately. And so by design or accident, those two have become inseparable in a way. I mean, I wrote a book about hip hop. Um, I've written a lot of articles. You know, I've written Sports Illustrated articles and New Yorker articles and, and non-travel articles, but travel is always my square one. So there is some separation, but the, the the best marriage of my of my travel and my and my writing is 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 travel writing itself. You asked if writing was always wanted to, what I wanted to do. Uh, I have a very specific Wichita memory of this. Uh, I, we took some sort of career test in seventh grade when I was at Hadley Junior High, and it came up dentist. And I actually <laughs> wanted to be I wanted to be a dentist at the time. But I think I was just sort of a goofy 13-year-old. Like I didn't – basically I thought, oh, I just want to go – I want to make a lot of money and, and, and not have to do too much school. And a dentist <laughs> seems, yeah. seemed easier than a doctor. But then I, I really got into reading after that and I started writing for my junior high and my high school newspapers. And there was just sort of this journey that, um, that coalesced in the ensuing years. And – even back in North High and, and Junior High to an extent, it was I, I was doing something besides sports where people came up and said, wow, this was really good, you know, that I was right. getting this positive feedback. And so in a way, in a way, my, my travel writing career does trace back to the North Star where I was really doing some creative things and, and, and sort of finding my voice as a writer. I mean, my old North High Star uh, stories are probably embarrassing to read now, but that was part of the process. And so I think by age 15, I, I was really... I really wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know how. I mean, I thought maybe I could be uh, right for the Wichita Eagle, you know, be the mm -hmm. the new the new Bob Getz. If you remember Bob Getz, who who did a uh, a column for the newspaper that I read a lot when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, and then almost by accident, you know, when I left, when I went to Oregon and went, well, I lived in Korea for a while, and then then the internet blew up, and suddenly I was living in like the the paradigm of writing that existed when I was a teenager. By the time I was in my late twenties, was completely different. And so I was writing stories from Asia. For, for this national online magazine and and um, sort of all of my anxieties about how to become a writer went away because I just made it happen. And when young aspiring writers ask me about that, I often say, well, look, you know, in the whatever advice I give you now in 15 years, the technology and the platforms are going to be different. So just just um, follow your passions and, and develop your craft and and you'll find a way to make it happen down the line. That's awesome. Cool. Um so we dropped that term a couple times, but can you define vagabonding for people that might not know what that means? Yeah, well, vagabonding, as opposed to just a normal vacation, is taking uh, an extended time off to travel, not just one or two weeks that are that are given to you, but six weeks or one year or two years or six months to travel slow and in earnest, and and not just have a vacation, but to travel because you are actualizing your travel dreams and you're making sense of what I call your time wealth. Your, uh, I think we spend a lot of time in life dreaming about other existences and other realities, but it's about making those travel dreams come true. Uh, and so it's about traveling slowly and meaningfully and and really seeing time as your truest form of wealth and, and, and reinvesting that time in, in, uh, in life changing experiences. Awesome. Um, so I'm vaguely familiar with uh, after college, you worked for a little while. Um, you took an eight-month trip around the U.S. in a VW van, and then you headed over to South Korea to teach English. Um, so do you have any, or first of all, why South Korea? And then do you have any examples of any culture shock that the Kansas kid who hadn't really seen international um, lands, what you might have encountered? If yeah, well, I had, I had some, some college friends, some <clears throat> friends from my, my track team had gone there, 
to teach English, and they they sort of they they're the ones who talked me into coming, and it was easy for them to talk me into coming because I was out of money, and you could you could make a decent amount of money back then by teaching English in South Korea, and so they just saw it as this this way to to sort of travel and experience another culture while making money and while you know partying and all that stuff you do when you're in your twenties. <laughs> Uh, and, and that was true. It, it was actually hard at times, but I always say that I have a special fondness in my heart for, for South Korea because it, it was so formative, you know, that I really came to terms with another culture and that I think a lot of my culture shock wasn't necessarily Kansas specific. It was just American specific. Right. Um, and I think, you know, maybe there's certain areas in New York or Oregon or California where you can sort of grow up with a more intela inter uh, internationalist sense of savvy in this regard. But you still have to come to terms, regardless of if you're from Kansas or from Portland, you have to come to terms with the fact that the instincts of other cultures are sometimes different. And we really take pride in individualism, for example, in the United States, whereas in Korea, individualism can be seen as a compromise of the of the group ethos or the, of family or community. And so uh, I think I just I, I stumbled into a lot of mistakes not realizing that the Korean mindset was a little bit different than, than, than the American mindset. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes as I was trying to learn the Korean language, I would accidentally insult people. But it was part of the process. And I think these are some of the fears that, that make people, that hold people back from travel. They're worried about embarrassing themselves or making mistakes or being lost or, or bored or lonely or completely overwhelmed by other cultures. But I think... That those are exactly the factors that you want to encounter because those are what make it special. You know, we see so much of the world through the through the phone on our screen these days that just going and, and being overwhelmed or making mistakes is exactly the point of travel. And man, I grew. You know, Korea isn't necessarily my favorite travel place in the world, but I grew so much in the two years that I lived there that I wouldn't trade it for anything. Awesome, that's really cool. Uh, my brother is actually about. I think he just crossed over six months vagabonding. Um, he started out in France and kind of worked his way around some of Europe and currently in Australia. And he had a similar situation. Um, I think he was trying to order a croissant or something in France and called a lady a certain name that you don't call ladies. And um, she just kind of laughed it off just because she knew he was trying and um, just the cultural difference. But it's one of those lessons. It, that's a good thing to keep in mind, too, is that at the end of the day, you know, you make a mistake and people aren't going to take out a sword and chop your head off you know they're just going to realize that that you're a person who's trying and, and it's actually better to do that it's it's better to just in your fumbling iteration of korean or french try and then people realize that you're doing more than than the other 10 tourists in the room is that you're not expecting them to cater to you but you're bending your journey towards them a little bit and they appreciate that and and we're lucky to live in a time when english is sort of the lingua franca of the world and mm -hmm. and and people are a little bit familiar with it and i don't know it's just it's just so much uh more easier and more accessible than what you might worry about when you're still at home mm -hmm. um so what does your travel look like nowadays are you traveling um a similar amount to what you used to um or like what percentage are you home in Saline County versus traveling wherever? Yeah, well, my peak travel probably came during that seven-year Asia stint. And, and, you know, a lot of that was expatriate living. I wasn't necessarily moving around a lot. I was just living in another country. Mm -hmm. And then it, that includes the eight months it took me to write Vagabonding. I was living in Thailand during that time. Um, and so that was that was sort of my peak Vagabonding. And, you know, it was, it was my dirtbag years where I was really traveling slow and close to the ground nonstop. Probably two and a half years of that was nonstop, and then there were some expat, expat stints in, there, in other places. Now that I have my home, um, and then I also have some, like I have a, for the last 15 years, I've been teaching a class in Paris every year. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess you could count that as travel, but it also, it sort of lends this very structured um, aspect to my year. I've done some university teaching as well. Um, and so, so really my vagabonding um, time is winter. You know, it's okay. usually, depending on the year, it's it's between November and March or April. Um, it, it's rarely that long. In the last few years, it's been two or three months at a time over the winter. Uh, I was in Hawaii last year <clears throat> and uh, Southern Africa the year before and South America the year before that. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so, yeah, that's my rhythm. And, and uh, one thing about, like, Southern Africa two years ago, 
like I rented a four wheel drive. I did some things that I wouldn't have done in my backpacker days. I, I was a little bit more of a, of a middle class traveler and, and like a dude who's in his forties, you know, I, I like mm-hmm. I can afford, I can afford to travel in ways I couldn't before. And that was interesting. You know, I saw some things in a four by four in Mozambique that I wouldn't have seen if I was on chicken buses. That said this winter, I really think my vagabonding stint is going to be a return to dirtbag travel. I want to, I want to go back to Asia and do some more of that chicken bus cl- close mm-hmm. to the ground, hostel, hostels and beaches and, and, and weird places type travel. And I, I'm pretty excited about it. I, I have yet to figure out exactly where. I'll probably start in Thailand and then go to Nepal or Sri Lanka or wander my way from there. But um, yeah, so it's become a, a part of the rhythm of the year is that I, I like coming back to Kansas, usually in the fall or the spring. Uh, but then winter is usually, is usually roped off from my, my wandering Awesome. Um, how do you decide where to go, I guess? Do you, are there any spots that you haven't been that you want to go visit, or do you just kind of pick a spot and then see where the wind takes you? Yeah, there's, um, it's, it's sort of a combination of, of gut instinct of sort of what I'm feeling versus life circumstances and, and, and uh, what I might be intellectualizing or what countries I haven't been to. In fact, this winter's travelers are, travels are literally – will probably hinge on places I haven't been to before. Like um, I'm, I want to go to Sri Lanka because it's an interesting place, but I've never been there before. So mm-hmm. I want to cover some new ground. Uh, a couple of years ago or three years ago when I was in South America, my, my brother-in-law had a Fulbright fellowship there and my sister and, and her kids were going to visit. And so I spent Christmas there and just, just wandered from there. Uh, so, it, and I talk about this in vagabonding that you don't really need a very good reason to go anywhere. Um, mm-hmm. that oftentimes just go to a place and then what you find there is the reason why you went there, even though you didn't know that before you left. So, um, yeah, you know, there's big stretches of central Asia, a lot of islands in Indonesia that I'd like to go to big chunks of Africa, like central and Western Africa and some more of Southern Africa that I want to go to. Uh, and I talk about this in vagabonding too. Of course, vagabonding was written before the term bucket list came into the parlance, mm-hmm. but but um, I don't I don't want to get too caught up in, in checking things off the list because I know these places are going to be there for me. Like I, I look at the map on the wall and there's Madagascar, this giant island off the southeastern coast of Africa. You know, I don't have any immediate plans to go there, but I know five, ten, fifteen years it'll still be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've, I've been trying to take my own advice to heart and just as the new year clicks over, find a reason to travel and then find a place to travel and then then be um, surprised by serendipity as I go. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I liked, I think, I'm not sure, I'm sure it was in Vagabonding, but it was also in some of your interviews or podcasts, but um, your point about not needing a reason to go somewhere, and you mentioned something along, along the lines of just go somewhere that interests you for whatever reason, whether it's you really like coffee, so you go to this place, or you really like beer, so you go to Germany, or if you really like anime, you go to Japan. Um, it doesn't really matter. Just go somewhere and experience that culture. Yeah, for sure. And 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 I think sometimes people are not – they're afraid to go to a place just because of the goofy stuff they love, you know. Um, but that should be exactly why you go to a place. You know, if you love to, to skateboard or, or play ping pong or if you like anime or whatever um, – Use that as the pretext, but then give yourself permission to deviate from that initial plan. You know, once you've once you've scratched the itch to watch some rugby in, in, in Fiji or New Zealand, then go wander a little bit, you know, and then I think that those can sort of braid together your initial interest along with all these crazy things that surprise you along the way. And if, you, if you're open to it and if you're not too worried about over planning your, your itinerary, then travel can just give you the greatest surprises. Mm-hmm. Um, so if for somebody that hasn't traveled a lot, so let's think about, I mean, just somebody in Wichita, I mean, myself even, um, maybe, I, w- I guess I was talking to somebody um, this past weekend that I was going to be interviewing you, and I mentioned a little bit about your book, Vagabonding, and they their exact words were, um, I've always wanted to do some sort of long-term travel, but I don't know where to start. Um, do you have any just quick tips on where that starts or how they even estimate because i know a lot of people worry about money and that kind of stuff um do you have any quick tips for that yeah well before even money comes into the picture just decide that you're going to do it decide that you can do it and you will do it and there's all sorts of factors that will make you think you can't including beloved family members right 
uh, and, and a lot of news media and a lot of cultural assumptions. But just just calmly and confidently tell yourself that this is something you're going to do. That's the first step. And, and I think everything falls into place after that. Now, it may take one year or two years or five years before it actually happens. But once you decide to do it, once you decide that you're not going to renege on your dream, then the wheels start to turn. Then you can figure out things like money. Then you can figure out ways of finding time or even finding out where exactly you want to go. But once you've decided that, then you're going to be reading about world events. You're going to be studying maps and websites, and you're going to, going to be soaking in information about where to go. You're going to be finding strategies to free up money for travel. And I think sometimes... Mm -hmm. I talk about this in vagabonding. We think that travel is something we buy, but no, it's, it's really something you give to yourself. There's a consumer level of travel, but there's an extent to which that you can live day-to-day -day life overseas for the same or cheaper than in a place like Wichita, Kansas. You can go to Indonesia and your your guest house and your food is going to cost less than, you, than your rent and your restaurants in, in Wichita, Kansas. So one way to free up money is just through simplicity. It's another thing I talk about in the book is just cut out those unnecessary expenses, make your own coffee, you know, um, pack your own lunch, um, cut your own hair, what, whatever it takes, <laughs> um, trade in one car and, and, and ride a bike or, or, um, do some ride share stuff. It, it's amazing how you can free up you know, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars every month, just, just through, through that decision to travel that basically it's like, yeah, you know, I, I could I could spend five dollars on a coffee, but if I if I don't spend that every day for a month, that adds up. And just how does that translate when I do get to Bali, when I do get to France or Sweden or Argentina? That basically that travel dream becomes a part of your life, and it becomes easier to sort of forgo those those comforts and conveniences and expenses that we do unthinkingly, but we don't have to do. Uh, and so, again, it goes back to that initial decision that all of your lifestyle begins feeding this travel dream, this this amazing experience that has yet to come. And then it just starts to make sense. It's fun. You know, I had before my big two and a half year journey through Asia, I was living in Korea uh, and every day I would go online and, and web surf about these distant countries. And it was just so exciting. It's like mm -hmm. it was like a part of me was already on the trip. Um yeah, and so going back to my initial advice, decide it's going to happen, and then slowly, slowly it will. Awesome. Um, one of the things that stood out in the book, too, was the idea of the near time horizon. And there was a story of the two monks. Um, I think it had a name, but the story of the two monks who would say, well, next summer I'm, we can go travel. And then the summer came, and they say, next winter we'll go travel. And then by the time um, one of them passes away, or it's too late for them to travel. And so um, I like your advice to just go after it and just decide, make the decision and then work towards it. Yeah. Well, those guys were monks, you know, but they made a vow to God that they were going to stay in the monastery. And so they said, and so one way to, to sort of assuage their wanderlust to say, Oh, we'll go next winter. Oh, we'll go next summer. But there are monks, you know, we're not monks, we, mm -hmm. we're not, but we do that. We do that anyway. It's like, yeah, the time never seems right. You know, it's, it's always like, yeah, I'll have a little bit more money next year. I'll have, um, you know, more time. I'll have a better job. I'll quit my job next year, whatever. Um, but it doesn't, life doesn't just plop these opportunities down in, in your lap. You have to take the opportunity. So if you go next winter, then find a way to, to hold yourself accountable, you know, and maybe it's, maybe it's not realistic, but tell your friends, you know, start a blog, start throwing stuff up on, on social media, throw up a little, a little, um, a little meme that says, you know, January 28th, 2019, that's the day I step out of my door and don't come back for a year. That's the kind of stuff that it, it becomes exciting. It's not just this, this daunting time horizon <clears throat> event. You're actually including the people around you in this exciting thing that maybe they want to do too, and maybe it'll, it will inspire them. So yeah, don't use the future as, as just sort of this constant way of justifying the drudgery of the present. Find ways to, to be concrete about your goals. Uh, and it's, it's, it's way easier than you think. Once you have that goal on the calendar, then things fall in place. There's, there's so many resources, so many more resources than there were even when I wrote Vagabonding 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I have a friend that's down in Columbia currently. Um, we used to work together at uh, Textron Aviation and then um, one day he kind of just decided he didn't want to do that anymore and he moved to Columbia. Um, he's got a girlfriend down there and they have a YouTube channel. Um, they just started their own podcast. 
And then, um, again, my brother, he's down in Australia, and him and his um, girlfriend are just kind of traveling and documenting it via Instagram um, just to share with family and friends. And if it grows into something that can support them, awesome. If it doesn't, they're documenting a great journey. So, Yeah, Columbia comes on, on my radar all the time. There's just a lot of people who go down there. I, I think it's, a still, it's still an affordable place. Um, there's places like Medellin, which you think mm -hmm. of as like a, like this drug lord town. But Medellin is this beautiful, convenient, perfect little place where things are super cheap. So it, it's, it's, it isn't the secret that it was five years ago, but there's a ton of people who are going with their Wichita income and moving to Medellin and, and living very enjoyable, comfortable lives. Um, it's not just Colombia, but it's a, that's a place that I hear about a lot. And actually, I know I know of a lot of travel bloggers and, and YouTubers who are um, who are basing themselves there. So I think something there's something special in Colombia these days. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. A lot of people do get dissuaded. They hear they're like, okay, Colombia, cocaine, dangerous. But they, I think they let the media or even just like entertainment influence. Um, which I guess that could be a good thing and inspire them to travel. But in that case, it might dissuade people that might otherwise really enjoy it. And this applies to a lot of other countries, you know, that that we, we we may have heard this or that, which makes us nervous about going to certain places. But if you sort of if you peer under the hood a little bit, if you dig, you don't have to dig very deep to find out that not only is Colombia, you know, affordable and beautiful, but they're just all these people who are already there that are excited about it. And they're they're doing their travel videos and um and, and again, Colombia is just one uh, of many examples of countries all over the world that either you don't hear about them or when you, you, you hear about them in the context of some negative thing. But it's just, you know, it, it's like any bad news. I just, I, just, I just tweeted out a quote by Henry Rollins today. He said, like, I've, I've traveled over 100 countries now, and I've, I've almost been killed three times, but all three times were in the United States, right? Right, exactly. Uh, that that if you if you actually look at certain American cities from the perspective of an outsider, they would they would seem as or more terrifying than the Medellins uh, of the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we forget that we we get used to this. Uh, in fact, I was in France uh, a couple summers ago where there was a terrorist incident in Nice on Bastille Day. I was in right. Paris. Nice and Paris are not close together at all, you know. So I had friends from Kansas saying, "Hey, are you okay?" And it's like, well, there was just a a mass shooting in Baton Rouge. Are you okay? I mean, it's that's exactly. that's the that's the kind of distance we're talking about. And so it's, it's very easy. I, we're, a, we're a sadly parochial country, the United States. And I'm, I'm very fond of the United States, but there are certain American mindsets. Because we're such a big and powerful country, we, we forget that we're not the only player in the world and that actually our country is dangerous in its own way. You know, that, that, uh, that really, if you were to take a bird's eye view of the world, the same thing that would keep us from going... Uh, to Medellin or, or or Beirut or other places, you know, Paris that that might we might be nervous about, are the exact same things that that pe would dissuade people from going to New York or Los Angeles or Wichita. So really, the, the the excuses out there are not. I mean, you can, you. I'm talking to your hypothetical listener. You can worry about them, but at the end of the day, you, you can worry your whole life and then drop dead, <laughs> or you can confront those fears and have some amazing experiences during the allotted years that you have on Earth. So. Absolutely. Um, so for people that might not be able to, um, maybe they have to stay in their job and they only have a couple weeks of vacation a year, um, let's say three weeks if they could roll over some days or something along those lines. Um, do you, are there any places you would recommend to get started on this long-term travel? I know it's kind of up to the individual, but do you have any places you'd recommend or um, kind of tips on how to make the most out of a three-week trip rather than a three-month or a three-year trip? Yeah, I, that's hard because there's so many good places. But I think, um, like, I, I try not to knock any kind of travel. If you want to go to an all-inclusive resort in the Dominican Republic and 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 drink rum for a couple of weeks, that's cool. Or if you want to go to to Europe and visit seven cities in in 14 days, that's cool too. I think that there's a lot better um, options than that. Uh, and 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 I really think people instinctively go towards that hyper program Europe trip or sort of the you know the hyper structured Caribbean trip when they could be doing things that are a lot more instructive. So for example, one, I'm I'm a big fan of traveling slow. So even if you do mm -hmm. go to Europe, don't do don't do seven cities in 14 days. Do one city in 14 days. There's a ton you can do in 14 days. Um, 
you know, Paris, Rome, go to the classic places if you haven't been there before. Prague, um, go to some smaller cities. You know, I went to Orleans, France a couple of years ago, Orleans, France. It's the sister city of Wichita. They have a little Wichita choo-choo train in the kid in the kid park there. Um, and the only reason I went is because I knew it was a city city center of Wichita. It's a it's a it's a perfectly beautiful little town. So that's one strategy. Go to the go to the classic world city in a place like Europe, and then just take a day train to a little village outside, and you'll be amazed by how French those little French towns are, and the Italian the little Italian towns are, and how Swedish the little Swedish towns are. So mm-hmm. maybe mix mix a big city with some, with a town you've never heard about. Another option is to go to a place, and this sounds like a long trip, go to a place like Bangkok, which is a crazy place. I love Bangkok. There was a, there was a song in the 80s called One Night in Bangkok Makes a, Makes a Hard Man Humble, which is sort of a silly song, but mm-hmm. that was weighing on my brain when the first time I went there. But you can learn so much by just, just wandering around, taking buses and taxis in one of those big, crazy Asian cities like that. Um, another ex- example might be Hong Kong or Tokyo or, 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 or even Seoul or... Um, Yangon, and basically be more exotic than most people give themselves permission for. Another good example that's close to the United States is Cusco, Peru. It's mm-hmm. the it's the um, it's sort of the gateway to Machu Picchu, which is a classic bucket list thing. I highly recommend it. Cusco is great. It's also ten thousand feet. It's it's like going to Leadville, Colorado, or something. So, and um, but it's just. It's so much more nuanced and interesting, and you you can learn so much even on a three week vacation. It's also a party town. I, I had a great time in Cusco, <laughs> um, but spend a co- spend three days getting used to the altitude. Otherwise, you might get sick. But that gives you an excuse to go out and, and drink those rum cocktails and and go dancing and stuff. Um, so basically, those three week vacations that you're trying to squeeze in, go to a place and travel slowly and that's far enough away and gives you a. Ch- chance to travel slowly enough that you can learn how amazing the place is if you gave yourself two months there. Mm-hmm. And and then you go back home and, you know, there's some jobs that by nature of their stability that you just, you, you don't want to compromise them. But oftentimes you can find ways to give yourself three months or a year. You can take, you can talk your boss into unpaid sabbaticals. You can, I, I have a friend who changed law firms. He was being recruited from a San Diego law firm to some less sexy place, Fresno or something. And he said, look, I'll go to Fresno, but give me six months uh, of unpaid sabbatical. That's all I ask. And they're here done, you know? So there's actually ways to find time. We just don't ask for them, you know? Right. Uh, and and we're no longer in the, in the Boeing age where you get your union card and you work there your whole, your whole career. That stability doesn't exist anymore. And since it doesn't exist anymore, why not integrate your, you know, less stable job or your gig economy job with life changing travel. You know, I've talked to Lyft drivers who've who've been to fifty countries. You know, mm-hmm. um, uh, I've talked. To, I've been on the Tim Ferriss podcast a fair amount, and he's talked about going to conferences with billionaires who ha- don't have time to do anything. Whereas there's park service workers and and strippers, you know, mm-hmm. and um, IT developers and graphic designers who just do it. They just make it happen. Um, and so that's a big thing I talk about a lot. Don't be intimidated by the price, by the supposed price tag of travel. Just travel and learn as you go, and and just find find shortcuts, find ways to make it cheap. It's it's doable, even even in a, a comparatively expensive place like Paris or Tokyo. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess as part of that, what are a couple tips for cheap ways to travel? I know there's hostels, um, which could be cheaper than let's say a hotel or obviously like a resort. Um, but what are some other tips like that? And have you experienced, have you done many Airbnbs or are hostels still kind of the go-to? Well, here's the deal with hostels versus Airbnbs. If you're traveling in a group, the Airbnb is going to be cheaper than a hostel. Mm-hmm. Um, I, my nephew and my sister met me in Paris a few years ago. We drove up to, to Amsterdam, checked out the prices. Like the, the scuzziest hostel in the red light district by the time you got three beds, it was like sixty dollars a bed. You know, Europe is expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, we found a, an Airbnb place uh, in Zandijk. It's like fifteen minutes by train out of central Amsterdam. We found this beautiful little cottage that we split, and it was like eighty bucks, right? Oh, yeah. So per person, it was less. So if you're traveling in a group, or if you can find other travelers that you meet on the road, um, maybe even travelers that you met in a hostel, uh, you can you can use Airbnb to split costs. 
um, and travel that way. That's one option. Two, hostels still work, and hostels are a great place to meet other travelers from all over the world. I, I would never knock traveler uh, hostels. I'm, I'm just saying that sometimes hostels aren't necessarily cheaper than splitting costs in an sure. Airbnb. There's also couchsurfing.com. I mm-hmm. used that when I was in Hawaii this winter, and it's literally free. You just sign up, and, and if somebody hosts you, then, then, then you stay on their couch or in their spare room for free. That's a great way to go. Um, that that was around before Airbnb. Uh, sometimes it can be a little weird. Like a lot of hosts in in uh, Hawaii weren't interested in me because I wasn't a young female, you know. So they're right. just sort of this sleazy dude demographic. But those are also crowd reviewed. So if so if there's a sleazy or unreliable couchsurfing host, then you'll find out. Just yeah, like if you're a, if you're a, a bad guest in couchsurfing, they'll find out too. So so couchsurfing is another option. Also, there's cheaper parts of the world. You know, if, if you're intimidated by the price tag of a trip to Stockholm or to Helsinki or Paris or Rome, then go to then go to Asia. You know, go to Delhi or, or Bangkok or Phnom Penh or these places that are just cheaper from the get-go. Bali, um, and I think people instinctively, just Americans instinctively go to Europe. I think because there's a lot of European heritage here. But mm-hmm. man. Man, your Asia is such an amazing continent. South America, there's just so much going on. Um, another corollary of that is off-season travel. Um, you know, it's one thing to go to Paris in July, but go in in February. Your ticket is going to cost a third that it that it cost before. Um, the, there's going to be more competition among hotels or even Airbnbs um, during that time of year. You'll be colder, but you'll have all of those museums and attractions to yourself. I'm a big fan of off-season travel, any place in the world. Places like Thailand, people travel less in the rainy season. Well, hey, get a little bit of wet, get, get a little bit wet, and you'll have these places to yourself, and things will cost a lot less money. So there's there's just a ton of strategies for saving money. I talk about them in vagabonding. Um, but you can also find them online, um, mm-hmm. saving money, be it an airplane ticket or a hotel, or even just you know finding a student student pass or a free day to get those museums. Uh, for example, in Sunday, a lot of museums are open uh, for free in Paris. Hmm. Um, I know I saw. I, I don't know if it was this past March or um, maybe 2017, but there was some tickets to France for. I mean, I don't know how much a normal ticket is, but it was probably three, four, or five hundred bucks. So it was pretty cheap for from Wichita to France. Yes, yeah, and you can actually plan a vagabonding trip around that. You know, you you could you could spend fifteen hundred dollars and go to France from Wichita in July, or you could find that four hundred and fifty dollar ticket in February, and then just then just stay yeah. in Europe, mm-hmm. T- take take the ferry to Morocco and 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 vagabond for a while. That, that you can that can be your pretext. That that fantastic fare. Uh, can be your pretext to go someplace when like the re- I went to Colombia once that's one reason why I know a little bit about Colombia but mm-hmm. I, I was in New York at the time there's like $150 round trip tickets to Bogota Colombia out of New York right um and so there's also websites out there that that basically you can become a a nerd of flight deals right. you can get on mailing lists you can find these these super saver websites and I know people from Wichita who've, do- who've done this um and uh and and really, then then suddenly those bargains are part of your inspiration to travel. You know, again, like I say, once you've made the decision to travel, things fall into place. And one way they fall into place is that once you start studying travel, you realize that the, the initial sticker shock doesn't hold. That you'll find loopholes, you'll find ways, uh, you know, to 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 get to Europe for four hundred and fifty dollars. You'll find ways to get to Australia for eight hundred dollars. You know, mm-hmm. ways ways to get to Hawaii for for five hundred dollars. And so. Um, it's just out there. You just have to look for it. There's there's so many ways to save money. Uh, do you have a first? Um, how do I want to say it? A, like something you do first whenever you get to a country. I know some people have said they try to find a beach if they're close to a beach the first time they get there. Or they might go maybe straight to the hotel or straight to the bar. Do you have a certain routine you go to? Yeah, the, the beach is a common one, and I actually mentioned that in vagabonding. Because I think because people like beaches, you know, and and I was just I was trying to talk people into slowing down, you know, don't don't mm-hmm. jump out of the airplane airplane into the museum circuit of the tour bus, go someplace and clear your mind, and a beach is a great place to do that. I'm a big fan of walking, uh, and one of my favorite phrases is "walk until your day becomes interesting," and so go to the, go to your place, check into your hostel, or your Airbnb, or your guest house, or wherever you're staying, and without even thinking about landmarks or goals or restaurants or, or drinking that 
special ouzo or whatever is on tap in your location, just start walking. Maybe maybe get right down the address of where you started. Um, but there's something to be said for just experiencing the texture of a new place. It's a multi-sensual thing. Suddenly you'll be smelling these brand new smells. You'll be feeling the air in a new place, be it warm or cold or humid or, or crisp or desert-like. And after two or three hours, I do this everywhere I go, after two or three hours of walking around in this new place, I'm just so much more attuned to that place. Um, I have a better sense of prices. I have a better sense of where people are lining up for food, which is where they're not lining up for food, what the public transportation is like. Mm -hmm. and, I'm not, and I'm not saying everybody has to do this, but man, it's a great strategy for just unwinding after that flight, not being too eager or overexcited, and just relaxing into a place. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you mentioned, I think it might've been on your first podcast with Tim, um, the concept of a flanor. And again, you mentioned that kind of walk until your day becomes interesting. Um, I thought that was really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. The flaneur, just in case your audience doesn't know what that word is, is a French word. It goes back to the 19th century. Um, and it's about uh, someone who is a flaneur is someone who walks through a city with no goal except experience. And so you're not going from point A to point B. Ultimately, you will end up at a point B. But you're just walking in search of whatever catches your eye. And it's something, it was invented by you know, Baudelaire and other French people in the 19th century because they realized that they weren't experiencing their own cities. Maybe this is a, an initiative for your audience to walk around in Wichita a little bit or bicycle around in Wichita. Um, but it, it's such a great strategy because it, it takes away those expectations of where you're supposed to go and it allows you to just wander around until you see something that catches your eye. It's a great, great way to experience a new place. Uh, another concept you mentioned was pick a color. I think I first heard that on Ari's podcast, but pick a color and follow that color through the city. So it doesn't really have any rhyme or reason other than you're just following the color yellow or the color red throughout a city that you, maybe your own city or another city you don't know anything about. Yeah, I teach a class in Paris every summer, a uh, writing class. And that's one of my initiatives. It's color tracking um, to really break them out of that mold because few cities in the world uh, outside of Paris have those expectations of where you're supposed to go, what you're supposed to do and, and, uh, you know, what you're supposed to experience. Uh, and so, yeah, follow the color yellow. I've had students follow pink or purple or some less common colors. Mm -hmm. And even if it doesn't take you on a specific trail through the city, suddenly you're seeing things that you wouldn't have noticed before. You know, you're realizing that the sanitation workers in, in, in Paris, all wear green uniforms, and they're kind of cool uniforms. Like the, the, like the sanitation workers are look cool, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and there's people who wouldn't notice that unless they were looking for colors. So that's called that's psychogeography. That's co there's colors. There's, there's a million ways you could go through a city. Um, music is another one, uh, and it's just getting you out of those those um, those set patterns that might take you into a cliched version of the city. And don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm big on cliches. I'm still not tired of having a picnic under the Eiffel Tower. Mm -hmm. 15, years on, 15 years on, I still go and drink wine and eat cheese at the Champ du Mar under the Eiffel Tower. But sometimes the ways a place can surprise you are so much more satisfying than the ways that your prescriptive destinations can provide. Mm -hmm. um, one other kind of misconception that you've touched on before um, is the idea of being lonely and bored. And in today's day and age, it's a lot harder to be lonely and bored because we don't let ourselves be with social media and our phones right there. But um, how being lonely and bored can force you into a new version of yourself um, and just the benefits of that. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds so simple. Actually, it doesn't even sound appealing. Like, who would want to be lonely and bored? But that used to be the standard... Um, you know, square one of travel is that you, there's a lot of waiting involved. There's not a lot of multitasking. Um, and you know, I'm not an extrovert. And so loneliness has been interesting to make me feel solitude on the road, but it's also made me more extroverted. It's, it's sort of forced me to interact with people and it's always rewarding. It's, it's always rewarding to sort of push up against my loneliness. Um, and that's something that if you have your, your smartphone on the smart, on the far side of the world and you're, reading news and scrolling through social media and, and exchanging WhatsApp messages with your friends back home, you're not being lonely. You're in this little bubble of home. You haven't really left home. Um, by, the same, by the same token, you're not bored either. You know, you're reading, you can read your Kindle or, or your, your pocket 
collection of stories or whatever mm-hmm. app it is that you can play video games. You know, the smartphone, which is in certain ways a delightful device, can really, really um, compromise your travels because then you get you get put into these these uh, habits. You're doing the same dumb shit. Can I swear? The you same can, dumb. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> okay, the same dumb shit that that you're doing back home. And, and God bless a place like Wichita. There's things you don't want to. I don't know, play those video games or, or right. you know, have chats with your same old friends. You want to be in it. And sometimes it takes being lonely, lost, and bored to be in it. And so it's counterintuitive. We don't we live in an age where I think a certain generation of people are a little anxious about the idea of confronting those or or leaving their smartphone at the hotel. Man, it's so rewarding when you when you bump up against when you don't have that app to fall back on. Um, and, and, you know, I say this as a, as a genera- Generation X guy, but man, I'm as beholden to smartphone apps as anybody else. I threw away Twitter and Facebook on my phone. And when I'm, I, I, I don't buy international SIM cards. Basically, I just use mm-hmm. my smartphone f- with Wi-Fi right. because, because I have the same monkey brain everybody else does. If, if, if the temptation is there, eventually I'm going to succumb to it. So I try to divorce myself. I call it the, electronical, the electronic umbilical cord. I try to cut that cord when I travel because otherwise – it's going to be a watered down experience of what I could be doing if I was completely unplugged from that smartphone. Mm-hmm. Um, switch it up just a little bit. If you had to recommend one place, um, let's call it an adventure in Wichita or Kansas, is there any one thing you would recommend first to people in Wichita or Kansas as a whole? Well, in Kansas in general, I'm a big fan of road trips. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, finding just like the smallest, goofiest little highway and going to a town with 300 people and ordering a beer. I mean, that's so rewarding. Or, or, or having a meal or going to the local museum and talking to the curator. I mean, if, I mean, maybe that's not for everybody. Maybe if you're the kind of person who just likes to go party, you know, go to the nightclubs, then maybe a small town in Kansas isn't for you. But I have discovered so many awesome little places just by following the principle of going and beautiful places. Kansas can be a really beautiful state if you allow yourself to be mm-hmm. surprised by it. Um, so that's my strategy. That's my adventure strategy in Kansas. Um, I mean, there's there's some good places to hike. There's some there's some 80 to 100 mile biking uh, trails now. Um, there's places like uh, Canopolis and, and Kansas where you can have some really beautiful hikes or mountain bikes or um, mm-hmm. horse rides. But in the interest of surprising yourself, just finding that small highway in a county you haven't heard of and driving until you find a goofy small t- town. And sometimes the, the only bar is closed, but there'll be a, you know, a knickknack store or something. It's just, again, it's that vagabonding attitude towards a familiar place where you'll just, you'll learn the most interesting things and, and meet the most interesting people. Like talking to 80 year olds, you know, I, 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 this happens all the time in Kansas, like how awesome lives people have lived, you know, even people in this seemingly uninteresting place like Kansas, there's people who've fought in wars or traveled the world or, or done some cool things. Again, it's just taking an interest in your backyard like you would in a faraway country. So that's my Kansas advice. Wichita advice, I mean, it's, I don't know if I have as, as specific a, as specific advice as much as just sort of be a nerd about Wichita. I guess that's a, that's a, a flipping the adventure idea, mm-hmm. but like go, going to those museums that you've never been to or, or those live music performances or, or those art gallery openings. There's a really interesting art community in Wichita. There's a really interesting live music scene in, in Wichita. Um, and if you're already vested in those scenes, great. But if you aren't, check it out. You know, there's, there's nothing to lose. Um, walk around, bike around, just sort of get to know the city on, on a sense level. And, and again, when I went back there three weeks ago, just going for a run in Wichita made me realize how much I just enjoyed, I don't know, experiencing it at a slow level, at a, at a pace of walking or running rather than just, than just um, driving to, to a friend's house. So, sure. I, so I guess that, that answer isn't really succinct. I don't have like the, the secret Indiana Jones adventure <laughs> uh, advice to Wichita but I guess just take an interest in what you thought may not have been interesting. And I, there's always surprises with that sort of approach. Right. And I think that just plays into the vagabond mentality. It doesn't matter where you are. It's just finding the best in wherever you are. Um, to play on the, the bike, they have like the new rideshare bikes, which you might have seen. Um, and then on the final Friday of every month, they have an art series across town at different um, new breweries and different places in town called Final Friday. And it's it's pretty cool to see the local talent and just see what people can do yeah it's worth doing i saw those bikes you know i've been i've been doing 
those bike those rideshare bikes in Paris for for years. They're called Valibs. I love seeing Paris by bike, and so I was really excited. I didn't I didn't use them my my most recent visit, but um, anybody who's listening, if you haven't, for me, please use those rideshare bikes. Be safe, you know. Don't don't <laughs> drive, don't ride in a in a stupid way. But but what a great pace at which to see the city and then just like all that stuff that that if you're not attuned to it you might end up ignoring it It, it, again it's like talk to people you wouldn't normally talk to go to events that you wouldn't that you wouldn't normally go to um i think i have a quote in the book about how you know people travel to stare and wonder at the kinds of things that they ignore at home right Right, exactly Uh, and and so so do it in wichita it's 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 been fun actually since i haven't literally lived in wichita for god for almost 30 years. Can it have been that long? Um, and it's, it's been 15 years since my parents lived in Wichita. They're my next door neighbors here now up in, in Sling County, uh, to see it as a tourist. It's been fun to see it as a tourist. And, and again, I'm, I, I always get a, a little bit excited when I go back to Wichita cause I'm really fond of the place. Awesome. Um, going to some of your writing, whether it's, um, I guess more books, do you get to write kind of whatever you'd like to write about or is it you have an idea, um, run it by the publisher or they have an idea and run it by you? How does that process work? It really depends. Um, it, I mean, it's a weird, it's a weird time, uh, for publishing. You know, like I started writing when there was still the old bricks and mortal gl- mortar glossy magazine, mm-hmm. work, work your way up to $2 a word type thing. Um, and that world doesn't exist in the same way it did 20 years ago. So, and gosh, it, it's been almost 20 years exactly since I quit teaching in Korea and I've been writing full time. So I've been a writer for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so often t- it really depends, you know, the, the best stories are never assigned, you know, uh, I'll go out and have an adventure. I'll write about it and then I'll sell it retroactively. There's less money that way. Mm-hmm. Um, Whereas, you know, I have relationships with different magazines over the years, National Geographic Traveler, Connie Nash, Na- Nash Traveler, um, you know, other venues, a farm magazine, where they, they, they give you the assignment. And so it's sort of a trade-off. You, you, basically, your expenses are paid when you're on assignment. You make good money. But you have to write about the parameters of the assignment, you know, right. that you can't. I went to uh, the Falkland Islands for National Geographic Traveler 10 years ago with the idea that I would write about wildlife. <clears throat> and wildlife was fine, but I was more interested in the people I met there and in, in these people who were more English than the English. But my editor said, yeah, no, you're going to have to write about wildlife. So um, that, that was the price I paid for writing for a, for a high-level magazine, whereas you know, some of the writing I've done for online venues, I've done some really goofy and interesting and exciting things. Um, but there's just less money in it. So, so it's a trade-off. Like, just like my podcast, I've, I've done – I've chased a few rainbows. I've done some goof, goofy things. I've talked to a couple of Wichita police officers. I talked to a Wichita filmmaker, but I have an international audience. You know, I just wanted to do those things because those things interest me. Mm-hmm. I, I also, I've also talked to, to world famous rock musicians and, and comedians and, and um, you know, influencers as well. But I like, I've always liked the chasing rainbows aspect of creativity. It just doesn't pay as well. Sure. And that was my next podcast, or my next question was about the DVA podcast. How's that been? Um, have you enjoyed that? That kind of mixing it up from just writing, and how's that journey been? Absolutely. And you know, I'm a mid-career guy. You know, vagabonding has done well for 15 years, and it's given me a bit of financial stability that, mi- that some writers might not have. Uh, part of that uh, financial stability is also being based in Kansas right. uh, rather than an expensive city like New York or San Francisco, where some of my writer friends are based. So, um, yeah, the podcast has just been a great, it's been deviate in several ways. You know, I, I've, I've been able to deviate from my subject matter, but also just sort of from my, uh, written journalist career. And it's been like, I haven't monetized. I'm not making money off the podcast yet. Although I have had some sponsors, uh, approach me. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to figure out how I'm going to balance that. I, that's another conversation I had with, with Ari from my last episode. It hasn't come out yet. I'm still editing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, I don't know how it is for you, but um, I've just found it really rewarding. Money notwithstanding, I've just enjoyed the conversations I've had. It's given me a pretext to talk to people that I've always wanted to, to talk to. Um, and just creatively, if not financially, I've, I've loved it. Yeah, it's been, I mean, like you said, really rewarding for me. Um, I, kind of, I, I kind of started this Instagram page just to kind of feature some of the cool places and people of Wichita. Um, and that kind of rolled into 
man, I've always listened to podcasts. Why don't I try it out and do it? And um, I mean, here I am interviewing you. I don't think we maybe would have had a conversation ever had I not started the podcast. So it's cool just to talk to. I mean, I've met a handful of people now that I never would have met or talked to um, just through this. And um, yeah, if I, I mean, I don't have any money coming in from the podcast either. And if, if that comes awesome, but again, the conversations are alone are worth the time and attention and effort. So. Absolutely. And, and we, we don't live in an era where you need a, like a journalist card anymore. There's no more press cards. You can just call up and say, Hey, I have my podcast. Uh, so it's been great. It's, it's been fun. And actually I love the, I, I think it's great that you're doing this, this Wichita talking to interesting Wichitans, because even when I was young and in Wichita, I was always interested in, in like, Wichita born and raised people who had been successful and wanted to talk about the city. So I love yep. the concept of your podcast. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so that, another question is, do you, so is it just you running everything? Are you recording, editing, doing the whole shindig? I, I do most of the creative and, and big picture production work, but my producer or co-producer, Justin Glow, who I've mm -hmm. collaborated with a lot over the years, he's a Midwestern guy. He, he spent a lot of time in Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, he does... Basically, I put edits up on a spreadsheet, and he lives in St. Louis, and he does the the actual edits themselves. I, I just did a a fairly episode fifty one is gonna is a fairly involved uh, episode with a Kansas born beat poet named Charles Plymel, um, and so yeah, I, I there was basically I wrote a script for that one, and then he follows the script, and then Jan Fetterman, one of my former Paris students, who's actually a lawyer in New York, he does the show notes. He helps me with the show notes. Cool. But most of the production itself is me. And do you have uh, do you have partners, or are you, are you all DIY? Uh, it's just DIY doing uh, using Audacity and kind of just playing it by ear and holding by seat of my pants. Yeah, but that's how I mean. Tim Ferriss started that way. You yeah. Know, he, oh, for sure. He he cobbled together his own theme music and did his own editing when he started out. So that's I mean, anybody who's listening who has an idea for a podcast, it's really a a, a do it sort of thing. I was talking with Ari Shafir about Joe Rogan, who has a really popular podcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ari's podcast and Tim Ferriss's podcast, but like Joe Rogan is like top shelf, super successful podcast. Yeah. And we were talking about like people are pitching Joe about TV shows and Ari and I were talking about travel TV shows and stuff, but he, Joe's in the place because he did it himself, because he has such a distinctive brand and he's, he brings in all these different interests from, from MMA to politics is that he's created his own niche, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the great thing about podcasting is that you don't have to ask permission for what kind of content you can do. You can, you can just nerd out on what interests you and enough people, if enough people are interested in your content and your personality, then you can carve out a niche for yourself. So I, that's been the fun part and I'm still learning. Um, as I'm sure you are too, yep. but, uh, that's the fun part of podcasting for sure. Um, so what's something, a couple of these questions you might think are familiar. Um, Tim might've asked you, I, I kind of cherry pick from him. Um, Rogan, a lot of those guys, I try to pull some of the stuff I like from those. So, um, if any of these questions remind you of those, that's where they came from. But, um, is there something you often recommend to people, whether that's a book or a podcast or movies or anything like that? Yeah, well, I, that's a question that Tim uh, asked me when I, when I was I, I forget I, I was like number thirty in his podcast years ago. That was like five years ago, and I said Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Um, but now, God, I'm a huge I'm a huge podcast fan. It, it's funny I was so into podcasts that I realized that if I didn't do one of my own, I I would feel left out of the conversation. Exactly. Um, so, so, so there's a bunch, you know, all of those, Tim and, and Joe and Ari all have really fun podcasts. There's also some more traditional ones. There's one called 99% Invisible, which is about uh, design, mm -hmm. which I really like. There's some classics like, like, um, uh, Radio Lab and This American Life, which are certainly no secret. Uh, I'm also really into, uh, screenwriting on the side. There's a podcast called Script Notes, um, which is uh, Craig Mazin and John August. And if you're interested in screenwriting at all, it, it's so interesting. And the guys are just, just have such interesting personalities that it's just sort of listening to friends. It's like listening to friends having a chat in your house. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what else? W one other, one other, uh, oh, the, like the Ringer podcast, network of podcasts, like the, the Ringer, the sports network with oh, Bill yeah. Simmons. Mm -hmm. um, and their, their critic, Wesley Morris, who I interviewed in my own podcast, um, who has his own New York Times podcast all, called Still Processing with Jenna Wortham, which is a little bit more serious. It's about race in America and popular culture and things. But really, I just love 
Wesley Morris and Bill Simmons, I could list, listen to talking about anything. And they both came out of that Grantland ringer fa- family of pop culture and sports podcasts. I could ramble forever, but those are my, uh, those are my recommendations. And as an aside, when I was flying home from, uh, from Los Angeles, I was, um, I knew I, I knew that you were going to talk to me, so I listened to your Stephen Wynn episode. Mm-hmm. And as you got towards the end, it's like, oh, you're totally stealing those Tim Ferriss <laughs> questions. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And again, I appreciate you listening. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite failure in any aspect of life? Oh, well, failure as a writer um, made me who I am. I've, I've probably talked about this in other contexts. But I, when I traveled America and lived in a van for eight months, I tried to write a book about it. It was called Pilgrims in a Sliding World. And every, I learned so many important things from that book um, that basically – this is a corollary of the podcast advice I said a few minutes ago is that you, you just start doing it and you find your way. And by every measure, that was a failure. But I learned so much about writing and storytelling and and, uh, and reporting and – uh, that made me the writer I am. This failed book that I was humiliated by in my, it wasn't even a book, it, it was a book project, um, in my 20s taught me everything that I'm still using in my late 20s, 30s, and now 40s. And one of the best pieces of advice I got as I was putting that work together was actually from my high school teacher at Wichita North, John Ferdine. He died in 2000. Um, and I would go, he was just one of those classic great English teachers. And in my early 20s, my friends and I would go visit him and we'd hang out and and talk. And he basically said, I was frustrated by this book. And he said, this might be the book that you have to put away. And he Mm. was exactly right, is that I didn't need to keep rewriting it. I needed to just realize that it had taught me something, put it away and get on with my life. And that's literally what I did. I put the book away and I moved to Korea and that made all the difference. Um, So yeah, I, I I could probably write a short book about how that failure informed everything that came after. Awesome. That's really cool. Um, what is your definition of success? I think it's I think it's being able to spend your time in a way that that follows your interests, makes you happy, um, helps you surround yourself with the people and things you love, and maybe wake, makes the world a little bit better. You know, um, mm-hmm. I think there's often there's a there's a status and money oriented definition of success, and sure, you know, I buy into it. I'm I have my own tangential interest in status and money, but mm-hmm. I've realized that there's a limit to those kinds of success and that being able to spend your time in a way that brings you joy is way more important than a giant bank account or being being the top dog at Corporation X, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've just met so many travelers, so many people who've read Vagabonding. Really, after 15 years, people are coming back to me and saying, yeah, we, I met my wife and Thailand in 2007 and now we have kids and you know it's just uh, I hear these stories all the time and and it's the people who have decided that they're going to to spend their time in a life enhancing way and not worry about status and money and the other things that would force people to live lives that they didn't necessarily choose that makes the difference. Sure. Um, what's a habit you've developed over the past few years that's most improved your life? A habit that I've developed over the last few years Probably self-discipline in the face of ever more viral and purposefully addicting social media. <laughs> um, and this is an attrition war, you know, is that, that just when you think just when you think you figured out how to divorce yourself from the screen, you watch one Pixie song that you thought was cool in 1991, and pretty soon it's three hours later and YouTube has tricked you into watching every song, a video for every song you loved in 1991. Yeah. And that's a way, I mean, that's one way of exercising a relationship with your past, but it's also a way of keeping you indoors and and, and putting you through their, their ad filters and everything else. And so I think that it's a skill that's personal, but it's also professional. I give advice for people to enhance their travels and, and, and sort of make their lifestyle something that's more rewarding. And so I have to practice it too. And so my muscles for divorcing myself from the screen and for the umbe- umbilical, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the electronic umbilical cord are things that I have had to sharpen in recent years. Mm-hmm. Um, so just a couple more. You kind of touched on this already, but what's your favorite part of Wichita or is there a hidden gem maybe? Um, I mean, you've kind of touched on some of that, but I'll probably say I have a weird relationship 
with Wichita because I knew it intimately years ago, but now I come back and I'm like super excited about this Douglas, Douglas design district that I had no idea about. Um, and I did a book event at Watermark back in April and, and some people took me to a, like a, like a brewery, like a micro brewery in the Douglas design district. It's over like, I'm, I forget exactly. Is it central standard? Is yep. that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like, holy, holy shit. I, like I didn't know this existed. So like, like I'm, I'm refining the hidden gems. And, and that's one of those things is the Douglas design district isn't an accident. Like the city very wisely decided to develop this old infrastructure. They did the same thing in Delano. Um, and actually, I don't know what your opinion about the new baseball stadium is, but I'm actually sort of excited about that. Like, I'm really into the history of Lawrence DeMott Stadium, but I also think it's cool that a minor league uh, a farm team is going to come back into town. So so that's the status I'm in, where I'm, I'm sort of stumbling myself into parts of Wichita that, you, that are no surprise to people like you who are still living there. Um, you know, I'm a West Wichita, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also a guy, when I was 12, I would ride my bike to Cheney Lake, and after you got past the zoo, there was no city, you know? Right. So... So I'm like this cranky old get off my lawn guy who's not familiar with, like West <laughs> Wichita to me is is east of West Street, you know, or or just a little bit west of West Street. So, mm -hmm. um, I guess that's a rambling way of saying I don't have a specific hidden gem, but my best strategy would be for anyone allow yourself to be surprised if you're if you're comfortable in East, east Wichita. Um, go to West Wichita, go to West Street and find some, you know, grungy little Vietnamese restaurant that you've never heard of and odds, odds are, or a Thai restaurant, I'm thinking of one specifically on West Street, um, that you've never eaten in, you know, just, just to have that adventure, you know, um, allow yourself, instead of listening to my hidden gems, allow yourself to find a hidden gem just by even South Wichita, um, which I didn't go to very much. There's just, there's some goofy little locally owned businesses down there and, 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 um, and pour one out for uh, for uh, Starlight Theater, right? The drive-in right. theater. Oh yeah, that just came out. Yeah, R. I've R. always taken I always taken my guests from Italy and New York and all over the world to see movies at Starlight when we go to Wichita, and now it's closing down. So rest in peace. That was a cool place. Yeah, it is a sad day. But on the note of the baseball stadium, I'm I'm super excited for that. I think it's cool that a affiliate team is coming here. Um, hopefully that hopefully they stick around and we support them so they have a reason to stick around. Truly, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big sports fan. I'm a big baseball fan. And, and I appreciate the history of, of Lawrence Dumont. And Wichita has a really, really interesting baseball history. But that was just an old stadium. They, they, that yeah, needed to come old. out. And I think, I think it'll be a cool anchor for the Delano area. It's going to change a little bit, you know. Um, there'll, there'll be people. I mean, it's just like when, when they built that arena in Brooklyn, you know. Mm -hmm. Delano, be, Delano being Brooklyn to Wichita's <laughs> Manhattan. Um, People will complain, but uh, my gut says that Delano is going to be a very cool place with this new stadium, and I think it's mixed use. There's going to be they're going to be able to play soccer games there. I'm an old Wichita Wings fan. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, I would watch indoor soccer, um, and so I'm a I'm a big believer. Like I have my art side, but I also have my sports side, and I'm a big believer that a that a well loved and successful and nationally connected sports team uh, can only be good for a city. So I'm excited to see what happens. For sure. Um, so just one more question. What does Wichita mean to you? Yeah, well, I, you asked that to Stephen. I forget how he answered, but man, it's just home. I mean, even though I don't live there, Wichita is home to me. Uh, and so I have that that sort of love for a place like you would have love for a family member. Like even if you don't see that family member for a long time, you just have this core affection. Mm -hmm. um, and and so this is just a warning. Like everything I've said about Wichita, this whole interview comes from a place of love. Like I could never be objective and critical of Wichita, um, just because it's it's my home. It's a place I'm rooting for. It's a place that I get excited about when I go to, like the film festival. Like the film festival, yep. the Tallgrass Film Festival has come since I lived there, and I have friends who are involved in that. I'm, and I'm just so rooting for for that sort of thing. The, the film festivals and these new microbreweries. Uh, and so that's just a, a micro way, uh, micro, uh, a rambling way of saying that, um, that it's, it's tied in with love and, and home, you know, that I'll always be a Wichita at heart. Awesome. Um, Rolf, do you have any final comments or calls to action for Wichita? Um, maybe a couple of things. Uh, and they, they sort of go hand in hand, travel the world, man. Wichita doesn't need to be um, to anchor you to it. And just because Wichita might be perceived as a provincial or regional place, it doesn't mean that you can't be in, in Tibet or Uruguay or Tasmania a week from now, you know, that you can be a global soul and be based in Wichita. And the flip side of that is that don't, um, 
don't put down your hometown. You know, just don't disparage it. I'm sure there's it can be a little bit dispiriting to be in Wichita, especially when the, the winter snow in February is all dirty and piled up in the parking lot, right? Mm-hmm. But um, but I'm a big believer in Wichita pride. So travel the world and love the world, but um, but love Wichita too. It's a cool place. Awesome. Um, Rolf, really appreciate it, man. Is there anywhere um, you're most active on social media? Um. Maybe, maybe, um, actually my podcast deviate is probably a, a good place to start. Go to rolfpots.com. Um, I, I, I blog a couple times a week. Oftentimes one of those entries is a podcast. Um, I'm on Twitter at, at Rolf Potts. I'm at Instagram at, um, at Rolf Potts. Both of those accounts can be interesting, but in the interest of getting away from the screen, sometimes I let them lie fallow for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but rolfpots.com is sort of, it connects all of those sites. So that's probably the best place to start. Perfect. Yeah, I'll link all those up and um, I'll listen back through and link anything else we talked about. But uh, Rolf, I really appreciate it, man. Um, this is awesome getting you on here. Yeah, good talking to you. Good luck with your with your podcast. Thanks again and good luck on the winter vagabonding. Yeah, thanks. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. Thank you to everyone who stuck it out and listened to the episode of the Wichita Live podcast. Thanks to the local Wichita band, The Caves, for use of their song. You can find links to everything we discussed in the show notes at wichitalifeict.com. Hit the subscribe button on your podcast app so you don't miss any of the interviews we have coming up. If you have any comments or recommendations for our podcast, feel free to contact us at wichitalifeict at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, hasta luego.